Hi, good evening. My name is David Grazian, and I'm the Faculty Director of Urban Studies at Penn. On behalf of myself and uh, my co-director, Elaine Simon, we would like to give thanks to the Bodek family for supporting this lecture, which is intended to bring scholars and public figures together to highlight issues related to increasingly complex, multi-ethnic and racially diverse urban and metropolitan settings. This year's Gordon S. Bodek lecturer is Eva Rosen, an assistant, soon to be associate, uh, professor. <laughs> Uh, professor at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Professor Rosen received her PhD from Harvard University in sociology and social policy. Her book, The Voucher Promise, about urban inequality and housing vouchers was published by Princeton University Press in July 2020 and is the winner of the Paul Davidoff Book Award. She has published papers in journals including the American Sociological Review, City and Community, Social Problems, Housing Policy Debate, the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography, and the Annual Review of Law and Social Science. She will join the Russell Sage Foundation as a visiting scholar in 2022-23. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rosen. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you all for showing up on a Monday evening. Um, <clears throat> I hope it's not too dark and I can keep you entertained. Um, thanks so much for coming. So the work I'm gonna talk about today is from a project looking um, at landlords. Um, I'm gonna put the book aside since um, many of you in this room I think heard me talk about it for a lot of time today. And um, talk about a project that sort of came directly out of that book but is focusing specifically on landlords and how they um, shape the affordable housing market and how their behaviors and attitudes impact the lives of poor tenants. So I do wanna thank thank um, my co-authors on this particular um, paper, Phil Garboden and Jennifer Costleone. So in this paper, we draw on interviews and observations with just under 160 landlords, all of whom rent in the affordable housing market, and they do so in four cities. So we're studying Baltimore, um, as usual, Washington, D.C., where, of course, I live currently, and then also Dallas, Texas, and Cleveland, Ohio. And we examine how these landlords make decisions about who to rent to and also what role race plays. Now, landlords and supply side actors are really understudied in research on residential inequality. They're generally assumed to just do what the market incentivizes, right? But landlords, of course, like everyone else, they're not always rational actors. They may act based on emotion, based on prejudicial thoughts, based on racism. And landlords are, tr are making tremendously important decisions about who to rent to, in which properties, and if and when to evict. Sociological research increasingly highlights this key role that landlords play as gatekeepers to housing markets. Of course, this gatekeeping takes many forms, but one of its most pernicious is racial discrimination, or what we typically think of as, of as the privileging of one group's access to housing over another's. And we know from a long line of audit studies, which is a method um, primarily developed by HUD and the Urban Institute in the 70s, we know that housing discrimination happens and we know that it happens along racial lines. Most of this kind of research focuses on understanding what happens when, for example, a white and black applicant who are otherwise identical apply to go to the same, apply to the same apartment. And again and again, these audit studies show that tenants of color are shown fewer apartments, accepted less frequently, and even charged more money when they are successful at renting. And the main takeaway from this research is that while racial discrimination in housing has decreased in recent years, there remain significant barriers, especially for minority groups. Recent research uses audit studies to look not just at race, but also at housing subsidy acceptance. So a recent study conducted by the Urban Institute found that many landlords do not accept housing vouchers, as many as 76% in LA. There's also research looking at the intersection of race and housing subsidy status, highlighting the ways in which landlords often conflate the two. Now, in this research, we wanted to move beyond some of the limitations that audit studies pose in studying residential discrimination. In particular, there are two key assumptions that are commonly made in this type of work that we'd like to challenge. 
The first is that gatekeepers are confronted with an applicant pool that is heterogeneous with respect to race. In other words, the idea that landlords are choosing between a black tenant and a white tenant. This assumption limits our understanding of discrimination to the act of favoring white tenants over non-white tenants. The reality of urban housing markets, of course, though, is that historical patterns of residential segregation intersect with other structural barriers to drive not only selection um, into housing, but also selection into the applicant pool itself. And this means that landlords are much more often selecting between same race applicants than from a tenant pool containing multiple racial groups. The second simplifying assumption is that race represents a phenotype that can be experimentally manipulated simply by changing a single signifier, something like skin color or name, rather than an intersectional, socially constructed category that is both ascribed and performed. This literature tends not to probe deeply into the meaning of race and the process of racism, limiting our ability to understand how discrimination actually operates today. Sociological theories of new racism suggest that even as measurements of traditionally racist attitudes are going down in surveys, more covert and subtle forms of racism persist. But again, there's little work connecting research on racial attitudes to its consequences for real life behavior and outcomes. So we wanna push beyond the limits of these assumptions by describing how landlords screen prospective tenants in predominantly homogenous rental markets and how landlords' racial constructions of these prospective tenants shape their strategies. So there are some key questions that follow. First, in a housing market that is segmented by race, how do landlords decide who to rent to? And we wanted to understand how discrimination worked in real life settings where, where landlords often have a pool of prospective tenants that's already mostly segregated across neighborhoods. It was clear to us that race mattered in these decisions too, but not in the way we typically think about it. We also wanted to know what role do race and racism play in landlords' tenant screening processes? In other words, how do landlords actually think about race? What does it mean to them? How does their understanding of a tenant's race shape their screening practices and their decisions around who to rent to? And finally, how does race interact with other stigmatizing factors such as gender, education, voucher status, and eviction history? We know from decades of important work in sociology and in other fields that race is so much more than skin color, that race inter interacts with other things about a person, their gender identity, their class and educational background, their housing subsidy status. And this is, of course, what we call intersectionality. But we have little understanding of the role that it plays for landlords and how it operates in tenant screening processes. So to give you an example of just how spatially segmented housing markets are, I wanted to put up a map of Baltimore just for a minute. The inner black line here is the city, the outer black line is the county. And on the left, you have a map of poverty, on the right, a map of racial segregation. Both of these maps show a sort of butterfly pattern where poverty fans out to the west and east sides of the city. When we layer on locations with people, where people with housing subsidies live, this butterfly pattern comes into even sharper relief. The places where voucher families are most likely to find housing are those with high levels of racial segregation and concentrated disadvantage. And in all four of our research sites, voucher tenants are disproportionately likely to be tenants of color. This is just one example of how housing markets are segmented, but I thought it was a particularly helpful one. All right. A couple words on methods. So we conducted semi-structured interviews and observations with a randomized sample of landlords and property managers across four cities. The research sites were selected to provide a range of housing market contexts. So first we have Baltimore. It's a poor city in a relatively wealthy metropolitan area with older housing and a declining population. Um, these are out of order. I was going to say Dallas. Okay, Dallas has poverty rates similar to Baltimore, but its population is booming, its housing stock is much newer, and it has a larger proportion of corporate professionalized landlords than elsewhere. Cleveland is the poorest of our cities. It's also located within a poor metro area. It has declining housing stock and high levels of racial segregation and a high proportion of less professionalized mom and pop landlords. <clears throat> 
Finally, D.C. has the lowest poverty rate, but also some of the highest inequality, with pockets of deep poverty located mostly in the southeast quadrant of the city. Now, we pulled the sample by scraping rental property listings in all four cities. Importantly, we wanted to capture the full range of landlords that was operating in the affordable housing market. So to do this, we sampled from two places, those who marketed their properties um, to both subsidized and uh, unsubsidized renters. So Craigslist.com on the one hand, and then GhostSectionAid.com on the other. And then what we did was we threw out any listings that were over 150% of the fair market rent, again, focusing on affordable properties. We then geocoded the listings, we matched them to census data on race and poverty, and from there we pulled a random sample that was stratified by neighborhood race and poverty. Then we started making phone calls. That was the hard part. <laughs> Um, we have about a 75% response rate, so we do feel like we've gotten a really broad swath of the market here. Um, in total, we conducted interviews with 157 landlords. Um, just briefly, around a third of the landlords were black, around a third were white, 58% were men. Close to three quarters owned rental properties, while over a third managed other folks' properties. Some did both. Our goal with each of the interviews was to speak to the person who made decisions about who to rent to, for, the, for obvious reasons um, pertaining to the subject of this paper. Um, and our sample really does reflect the distribution of urban rental real estate. So over 55% owned or managed fewer than 30 units, what we consider to be small or medium landlords, and about a quarter um, owned or managed more than 100 units. Finally, um, we have landlords um, both who said they accepted or would accept vouchers, as well as some who did not. All right, on the interviews, each interview lasted about two hours. It was designed to be semi-structured, as I mentioned, focused on, focusing on landlords' business strategies as well as their professional and personal histories. So we asked respondents to recount the entire history of their business, how they acquired each property, how it was financed, how they screened tenants. Interviewers followed the natural flow of the conversation, allowing for emerging insights to surface beyond our initial category of inquiry. And this sort of free-flowing interview style allowed us to capture data on potentially sensitive topics like race and discrimination. In order to avoid social desirability bias, we trained field workers, um, and when we were doing the interviews ourselves, which was actually most of the time, um, we didn't ask directly about discriminatory practices. We didn't ask landlords to explicitly compare tenants by race, um, but we allowed it to come up naturally by asking landlords about the, ho the whole process through which they screened their tenants, what motivated them to take a particular approach, um, and, and that's, for the most part, how race came up. Um, we also conducted ethnographic observations with a subset of landlords as they went around their day-to-day -day business. These data provided additional valid validations of the events and different kinds of processes that we were talking about in the interviews. Um, we also examined the field of landlording more broadly in each city. So we spent time in housing court, we saw eviction proceedings, rode along with sheriff's deputies as they conducted evictions, spoke with city officials and tenant advocates, attended real estate auctions, and joined investor association meetings. All right, so how do landlords screen? Um, most simply, we find that landlords navigate the screening process really differently depending on their size, their market position, and of course also their ideas about who makes a good tenant. Now the conventional wisdom is that when landlords choose tenants, they're trying to select for unobservable traits like the tendency to pay rent on, on time, the tendency to stay in the unit for a long amount of time. However, it's of course impossible pr to predict these things directly. So in order to do this, landlords have to rely on observable traits that they think are proxies for the unobservable ones. So on the one hand, they can rely on official legal tools such as credit checks, background checks, residential histories. Um, but often a notice is that from the landlord's perspective, more important than being legal, a good screening tool needs to be able to distinguish between applicants. The applicant pool, in other words, must be heterogeneous with respect to the criteria that you're judging. So in a heterogeneous market with a range of credit scores and incomes, these criteria in the blue box here will indeed help landlords distinguish between applicants. But in the low-end market, or in really any market niche, legal criteria sometimes aren't that distinguishing. 
The racial composition of the applicant pool starts to be bounded by neighborhood segregation, making the applicant pool more uh, homogenous with respect to race. Things like credit score tend to be uh, poor across the board, and potential tenants tend to fail on some or all of these official tests. And in these cases, legal criteria just aren't going to be that helpful in selecting a tenant. So landlords then start to rely on things that they think are proxies for these unobservables, traits that are technically illegal to screen on, uh, such as uh, gender, race, and family, tapping into any prejudices that they may have that shape their views of certain types of tenants. Also, depending on where a landlord's property is located, a tenant with a voucher subsidy may be hugely beneficial financially. Their rent is paid reliably, and in some cases, it's higher what you, than what you can get for a market tenant. But vouchers come with all kinds of perceived risk and stigma, too. Voucher tenants are more likely to be people of color. In fact, in all four of our sites, the voucher programs are predominantly African American, over 85%. Voucher holders, even more than low-income renters more broadly, are likely to be women. They're likely to have larger families. This triggers all kinds of fear and prejudice on the part of landlords. So in this market, there's sort of a vacuum created in the blue box. Very little, whether legal or illegal, good proxy or bad proxy, is actually distinguishing between tenants. So how do landlords decide? Well, what we find is that they lean on their own understandings of their tenant's identity, understandings at the intersection of race, gender, behavior, family presentation, and other subtle cues. So the goal here is to better understand what's going on behind the curtain in landlords' minds. And one of our big findings about landlords is that fear really drives these practices. The biggest fear for landlords is the possibility of saying yes to a tenant who then becomes what they call a professional tenant, a sort of imagined renter who is out to get the landlord, who moves in with the intent to stay as long as possible without paying rent, and then moves on to the next unwitting landlord. So Joan Carter, a white woman who owns two rental properties in the Baltimore suburbs, explains that she is afraid of this professional tenant. There are people, she says, who are professional renters. When you get them in, they pay their first month's rent, and then they have you for six months. Landlords are always on the lookout for this professional tenant, even though few report having actually encountered one. Bill, a white landlord in Baltimore, also explains, um, there are professional tenants that slide by with sloppy evaluations and they move into a property and they never make another payment and then they live there for three or four months until they get evicted and then they do it again. And finally, Roger, similarly, and interestingly, Roger is one of our DC landlords. Um, we, uh, we, we studied the first three sites, sort of learned about this professional tenant model and made the explicit choice not to ask if landlords had this idea of the professional tenant, and it came up completely inductively in DC without prompting them about it at all. So we were sort of impressed about how durable this idea was. So Roger says, the regular tenant doesn't want to get into court. They try their hand a little, but when they see you're going to use the carrot, the stick or the carrot, then they fall into place. But the professional tenant is something different. The professional tenant is more savvy than the landlord. They go to landlord tenant court, constantly sitting in court as they go to the brink of being evicted, and then finally resolve it at the end. So the entire screening process is essentially designed to avoid getting stuck with one of these professional tenants who landlords think are out to get them by moving in and then staying as long as possible without paying. All right, our second big finding is that landlord size is important. Um, and I say landlord size, but I mean landlord property portfolio size. When we tried to publish this, the reviewers were very upset that we were talking about large landlords when we really meant <laughs> landlords with large property portfolios. Um, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the shorthand here. I think you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so I'll focus first on large property management companies, um, more corporate landlords who tend to rely on uh, formalized screening techniques, often outsourcing these decisions to computer software that weighs various observable factors like income, credit score, and residential history. So these more professionalized landlords tend to rely on screening software algorithms, often designed by third-party companies. You may have heard of some of them, CoreLogic, RealPage, LeaseRunner. Um, when asked when, at, when we asked, property managers um, like one woman, Tracy, uh, 
we asked her how she decided whether to accept a tenant. And she explained the process in very simple terms. She said, we just put their information in the computer and it tells us whether they qualify. And these algorithms account for legally observable traits such as income, credit, criminal background, and eviction history. And they allow property owners to make systematic decisions that protect them from fair housing lawsuits. So Tracy oversaw a large complex in Dallas, which are common in the city's low-end rental market. She's well-versed in fair housing law, um, and she discussed her screening criteria in really precise and rehearsed terms. We observed many small ways in which she could actually exercise discretion, for example, by marketing properties more enthusiastically to certain demographics. But the actual screening process itself was largely outside of Tracy's control. Her complex simply purchased software from the Texas Apartment Association. She'd plug the information in from each application, click submit, and the system automatically determines eligibility. Among those deemed eligible, the rule was simply first come, first served. Now, in the cases of nearly all the pro professional managers in our sample, corporate owners intentionally took the discretion out of the hands of managers, attempting to reduce both implicit and explicit bias in the screening processes, as well as the legal risk that comes with it. So, so long as property managers relied on software algorithms, owners believed they were protected from fair housing litigation. When asked to reflect on these systems, property managers emphasize the importance of fairness to avoid running afoul of fair housing law. Now this version of fairness means treating everyone exactly the same regardless of circumstances. So Rochelle, a middle-aged black property manager in Baltimore, provided an example. She said, when you come in and I shake your hand, I've got to shake everybody's hand that comes through that door. If somebody else comes in and I don't shake their hand, then their friend reports it, she didn't shake my hand. This can leave the company open to a lawsuit, especially if the two people differ in race or gender. Rochelle's company's solution to fair housing audits was sort of ever increasing levels of routinization. But the most meaningful system they use is the software that determines eligibility. And Rochelle noted that the system she uses gives her a straight yes or no, never allowing for any uncertainty. She said, it's not in between. If you don't qualify and you're short a dollar, you're still denied. Most managers reflected on these criteria pretty uncritically, simply as something that was determined at a corporate level in order to comply with the law. But in Rochelle's case, the limits of the algorithmic approach became obvious when she managed a property in a predominantly Latino community. The community desperately needed housing, yet Rochelle's development was running a 15% vacancy rate. The screening office was declining dozens of applications a week simply because they lacked a social security number and formal proof of income. In fact, the screening software was systematically discriminating against undocumented households who didn't have formal jobs. Had Rochelle's property been making money, this algorithmic discrimination would have simply continued apace. It is, after all, not against the law. But because it wasn't good for business, Rochelle was able to convince the corporate office to accept alternative proof of income, thus allowing her to get the vacancy rate down to a more sustainable 8%. But the supposed fairness ensured by this software doesn't just have potentially discriminatory, Im discriminatory impacts on the undocumented, it can also end up discriminating by race. The goal of any screening tool is to use observable characteristics as proxies for future behavior. But pro proxies such as credit score, residential history, and criminal background, while they're legal, can be really crude measures that end up serving as stand-ins for historical vectors of discrimination and are thus highly correlated with race. In some cases, these proxies are selected with discriminatory intent. But more often, algorithmic discrimination is what we call collateral rather than explicit, with landlords interpreting fairness in ways that reinforce other sources of injustice. Thus, by relying on, in one, wor in one landlord's words, normal screening techniques, landlords are in fact swapping out fairness at the structural level for really just the patina of fairness at the individual level. Roger is an African-American landlord in DC. He has made his own algorithm to favor the kinds of tenants that he thinks are most valuable. 
Roger manages hundreds of properties for more than 120 small landlords across the city of DC. And over 65% of these units are rented to voucher recipients. Roger sells this screening algorithm to landlords. What it does is it scores various tenant characteristics um, and then calculates an overall score for each back applicant based on their rental history, how many times they've been to eviction court, uh, the number of bedrooms in their voucher, the tenant's portion of their rent, and so on. Roger claims that his scoring system, quote, allows real estate professionals and landlords to quickly make an informed decision with regards to renting to Section 8 and helps them to steer clear of fair housing violations. So Roger knows there's money, there's the quote, um, Roger knows there's money to be made with vouchers, but he also knows that landlords are often afraid to rent to voucher tenants. They think they'll cause problems or trash the unit. But Roger thinks he can convince these landlords to open up to the program because of its profitability. His screening tool helps him to show landlords how to weigh different applicant traits and how much they stand to profit. For example, typically an eviction record counts heavily against a tenant's score, since this might suggest a risk to a landlord. But with a voucher tenant, Roger designed his algorithm to weigh the eviction against a more positive factor, the amount of the tenant's rental portion. So he says, um, some tenants pay zero each month, that's great. But if the tenant's portion is high, then it's a problem if they don't pay it. So then the higher that tenant portion gets, the more weight goes back to rental history. If the tenant portion is zero, then rental history isn't important. In other words, for voucher tenants, the algorithm helps the landlord discount a history of eviction if the tenant's rental portion is low. This helps weed out what are perceived as risky tenants while still favoring voucher tenants. Roger's interest in overcoming discrimination is less motivated by a desire for fairness, as in the previous case, than it is in helping landlords find a sustainable and profitable business model. The voucher program offers this, and the algorithm helps Roger sell it to them. Roger's understanding of his tenants is not inextricable from gender, race, and class. He explained to us that he grew up in similar conditions as many of his tenants, and that he feels he can relate to them. Yet, he also said he knows how not to be taken advantage of. He said, I'm accustomed to it. I'm cut from that cloth in my family. I have some very interesting people who have prepared me for this, so dealing with tenants like this, it's nothing. So Roger felt that his status as a black man allowed him to be uniquely suited, who had, who had grown up in what he said were similar conditions, <clears throat> allowed him to be uniquely suited as a broker who could help landlords navigate their relationships with voucher tenants. His business model operates by helping landlords feel comfortable renting to people they would otherwise not. His algorithm helps them to see how vouchers mitigate the risk they would otherwise associate with a tenant's racial and income background. Looking across the sample, there's really important variation in these techniques by landlord portfolio size. If we just look at the three columns on the right, the formal screening checks, right, these include credit checks, residential history checks, and criminal background checks, we see that it's the groups with the most property holdings, um, especially those with over 100 units, who were the ones that reported the highest incidence of using these formal screening methods outlined here in red. In contrast, landlords with smart, small portfolios were less likely to use these formal checks. In fact, many of these formal criteria just don't fit the lower end market at all. Mom and pop property owners generally fall outside of legal scrutiny and thus have less incentive to engage in this performance of fairness that algorithmic approaches provide. Instead, smaller landlords and less professionalized landlords use more informal methods. In this niche, many of our landlords didn't trust what tenants reported formally on their applications, and so they went to great lengths to cross-check information and learn about tenants in more informal ways. This involved things like asking tenants to fill out lengthy and cumbersome forms just to see if they could do it on time, checking their eviction records with multiple different spellings to see if they had lied about their residential history, things like observing tenants' children to see how well-groomed they were, and the smell test involves smelling the tenant's children to see if they were bathed. So again, looking at these patterns across the sample, um, let's focus now just on the informally col columns, landlords who do these home visits and rely on what they call gut checks. 
We see that the three smaller groups of owners were significantly more likely than landlords with larger portfolios to rely on this array of informal screening techniques. Around 45% of these smaller folks relied on gut feelings versus just 29% of the larger landlords. And while home visits were not very common among landlords of any size, as we might hope, around a quarter of smaller landlords used them compared to just 7% of, of larger landlords. And we found quite inductively that these were the most common of the informal methods with which landlords tried to identify suitable tenants from what they call an undesirable pool. Among these smaller landlords, uh, their applicant pools were often dominated by what they called lower end tenants who they thought of as less desirable, either because of their steady incomes, because of their belonging to a stigmatized racial group, or at times because they benefited from housing assistance in the form of a voucher. And this was, for landlords, what really legitimized the non-traditional scrutiny. As Edward, a white landlord who rents more than 70 units in Baltimore, put it, you're picking through the less desirable tenants anyway, so you want the best of the least desirable, if that makes sense. Wanting the best of the least desirable <clears throat> often meant arduous and disparate screening practices, especially for lower income black women tenants. Mimi, a black landlord in Baltimore with just a few properties, explained that desirable tenants, quote, desirable tenants, within all black tenant pools like hers are those who meet certain criteria beyond credit checks. For example, she said, if the tenant has children, the kids should look neat. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Let me, there we go. Uh, the tenant should, the kids should look neat and clean, their hair should be combed, their teeth brushed, their clothes should be clean. Stu, a black landlord in Cleveland with 20 properties, felt similarly about the importance of cleanliness. He said, I've come to learn over the years that sometimes you got to discriminate. I don't want to call it that, but let's just use that word. You have to have criteria. You have to have preferences. He went on, <clears throat> we go out to where they're presently staying and just pop up on them, check for cleanliness, check for control of their kids, that's a big one for us, to see if these kids can be disciplined and listen to their parents. You know, if they kind of raise their voice and start cussing, if they have no control, we don't want that. We maybe get a minimum of two applicants for a unit, so we'll have a couple of people to pick from and we'll pick the best of the two based on what we're looking for. And we're always looking for cleanliness. It's actually at the top of our list. We'll even take a little less rent if somebody, if for somebody that's clean, someone who's working, someone who's married with kids, has certain control on their kids, someone who's looking to be here for a while. So for these landlords, messy homes and unkept children are intersectional stereotypes associated especially with black single motherhood. Personality, character, cleanliness, and the ability to follow instructions mattered to these landlords, and they mattered more when dealing with these, quote, less desirable tenants, that is, those who were really at the intersection of being black, being in poverty, and being mothers. In some of our sites, um, as I mentioned, as many of a quarter, as a quarter of landlords described conducting a home visit with perfect prospective tenants' current living space as part of their routine screening practices. While landlords worried that more for formal screening tools could be manipulated by tenants, uh, paying an unannounced visit to someone's home gave these landlords concrete and undoctored information about, how the tenant, about the tenant and how they lived. I'm going to skip over these quotes just a little bit so I can get to the end and leave some time for questions because I'm noticing the time. So. Um, Last story, Gus is a white landlord in his early 60s in Dallas. And he told us that if we wanted to come along with him as he oversaw his rental properties, we were more than welcome. So for two days, we rode in the back seat of his pickup truck, covering hundreds of miles across the Dallas mega sprawl. Now I know some of you are from Dallas, so this probably looks familiar. Um, we got to watch Gus screen prospective tenants. And he did this while piloting his pickup truck at 70 miles per hour down I-30. Um, nevertheless, he insisted that all phone inquirers text him while driving. So one prospective tenant, a Latino man, uh, complied, and Gus responded with a lightning round of screening questions texted one after another. This tenant only got to question two. He said that his income was $3,500 a month as a contractor, but he couldn't provide proof. Gus noted dismissively, that guy eats what he kills, and simply stopped responding. Mm -hmm. 
Later on that day, Gus met a prospective tenant at McDonald's. Gus sat in relative silence while the middle-aged African-American woman filled out the paperwork. He collected the application, the $40 fee, and he said he'd be in touch. But when we got back to the truck, Gus noted that he never actually files the paperwork for which the fee is intended to cover. He said the simple fact that the tenant was willing to be screened was proof enough that she was good. It's not that Gus doesn't think screening is important, but he believes that the characteristics of a good tenant aren't written on their proposal. On their, um, sorry, I just misspoke. Um, he believes that the characteristics of a good tenant aren't written on their application or embedded in their demographic profile. There's some unmeasurable quality that Gus claimed he was looking for, sort of a combination of personal responsibility and stability that he said made for good tenants. But he could only meet this by leading by meeting them, he could only learn this by meeting them in person. For example, most of Gus's tenants are black and Hispanic, and he noted that he would never reject someone based solely on their race. But in the next breath, he declared, if they're just some, I don't want them. The flip side of this is that many landlords are accepting of tenants who they feel defy racial stereotypes. Robert, the manager of a building in DC, described one tenant who he accepted and how race played a role. He said, she was African American, but I didn't think anything of her coloring because I was thinking about the way she carried herself. This is where race, gender, and class collide, and where landlords' own construction of their tenants' race plays, comes to play an important role. In summary, larger landlords rely on screening algor algorithms that calculate a prospective tenant's score based on credit report, criminal history, residential history. In contrast, smaller landlords do not implement objective screening mechanisms, but often make decisions based on a gut feeling, a first impression, or an informal home visit. In addition, we highlight how race matters for landlords differently across market niches. For example, landlords who rent in certain low-cost markets understand their applicant pool is necessarily somewhat homogenous, and they will have little choice when it comes to tenants' race, income, and credit score. This changes how they value certain attributes. A tenant with a housing voucher, though stigmatized and frequently involving a tenant of color, might become desirable in such a market where a voucher can outweigh a low credit score, a history of eviction, or even a landlord's discomfort with a tenant's racial identity, especially if that tenant's portion is low, guaranteeing rent. In contrast, in low poverty areas, the intersection of race, class, gender, and voucher status amplifies stigma, making the voucher less desirable. In these markets, landlords use it as an exclusionary criterion. The voucher is thus an additional intersectional ve vector, alternately diminishing or magnifying existing stereotypes depending on the market context. We uncover a process whereby landlords use tools that are both gendered and racialized in ways that are really consequential for residential outcomes. Landlords, both large and small, black and white, recounted common narratives of the black underclass and the so-called culture of poverty. These beliefs, in turn, shaped how they talked about and evaluated their, their tenants. Thus, their distinction between a good and a bad minority tenant is based on the degree to which that tenant conforms to or resists modes of behavior that align with these insidious cultural narratives. In this way, we find that landlords are prompted to put aside certain racial prejudices when they have the right financial incentives, but only when the tenant also conforms to their racialized expectations. Um, a couple implications for tenant screening. So as Stu pointed out, rental property owners must discriminate. Um, in the sense that uh, a boundary must be drawn between those who will be admitted and those who will not. Tenant screening is, after all, the process of selecting one tenant over another. This research thus leads to the question, what screening techniques should property owners who have a business to run, vacancies to fill, mortgages to pay, use? Even if the process of discriminating is endemic to the low-end rental, rental housing, Harm reduction steps could be taken to soften its consequences, as the past half century of fair housing enforcement has shown. But neither the mom and pop landlords who act on their gut feelings, nor the corporate landlords who rely on screening algorithms, really provide us with a good model. 
How then should landlords decide who to rent to and what systems can we impose that might make this process more equitable and less discriminatory? So first, I think we must eliminate the screening techniques that serve no function other than as proxies for race, gender, and class. In our view, credit scores rarely serve any legitimate purpose in tenant screening. They're really just a crude proxy for poverty. Computational screening processes should focus almost entirely on a tenant's expected ability to pay, based either on wage income or housing voucher receipt, which should not be a basis for discrimination. For the goal of building a non-discriminatory housing market, or less discriminatory housing market, the housing voucher program provides some key hints where it is profitable for landlords to rent through the program, they seem to put aside their stereotypes of subsidized renters of color. <clears throat> As we seek to understand why and how discrimination happens, we must look not only to the proximate actors who maintain this system, landlords, but also to the larger context in which this, uh, that allows this to happen. The question of how landlords should screen is its is itself limited by a world in which housing is not a right. The fact remains that there is not enough affordable rental housing in this country, we do not have enough tenant protections, and we do not guarantee housing assistance. Certainly, we must hold landlords using discriminatory screening practices to account, but this research also points to the larger problem. Rental assistance for low-income families in this country is not sufficient to meet the demand, and private landlords are left holding the bag. One way they attempt to mitigate risk is by using imperfect, often racist, sexist, and otherwise discriminatory screening tools to judge tenants' worth. These findings also connect to important insights from recent literatures on inequality in other realms, such as employment and criminal justice, echoing the perverse effects effect that have been linked to ban the box policies in employment and algorithmic sentencing procedures, which have been found to reproduce discriminatory outcomes rather than disrupt them. When landlords are obligated to accept black and Latino tenants because the housing markets in which their properties are located restrict them to such populations, they put tenants through additional screening mechanisms that are unfair and perpetuate inequality. Uh, finally, our research highlights how the distinctions made by supply-side actors distinguish between low-income minority households, thus generating an additional level of social stratification. The screening techniques used by landlords in our study create winners and losers within already disadvantaged groups. By relying on a constitutive, socially constructed understanding of race, we can better understand both the bias embedded within informal screening tools and the bias implicated by punching data into a database and applying an allegedly neutral algorithm. Whether landlords re rely on these covert biases embedded in algorithms or the overt biases of gut checks and home visits, the result is to burden the housing search process for low-income tenants of color and to compound inequality based on race, gender, class, and other marginalizing factors. Thank you guys so much. I'm sorry for going over. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, Aline. Um, I was just wondering if um, you ran across any anybody who talked about using word of mouth or references from other people. Yes. So in the especially in the informal category among the smaller landlords, checking references um, was absolutely something they did. That being said, um, they felt like they didn't know if they could trust references a lot of the time. And so a lot of landlords, I skipped the slide on home visits, but a lot of landlords said, you know, I really need to see how this person lives. I need to see their current home. Um, I'd rather just go stop in on them and see how clean or messy or organized their current home is rather than calling their current landlord. And similarly, I'd rather look up their name in the eviction database than I would check with their current landlord because I need a more comprehensive view. In other words, they didn't didn't trust what the what the tenants told them and they didn't trust what the tenants previous landlords had told them so certainly they did use more informal word-of-mouth techniques but in many cases they went above and beyond that yeah you mentioned the race of the landlords who you interviewed throughout this presentation yeah. I'm curious whether you made any observations that related to the race or gender of the landlords so whether there are differences in 
Yeah, great question. I mean, there certainly were differences. Certainly, I think the landlords of color were less likely to say overtly racist things and they were um, less likely to be focused on race. But I think, as you saw from some of the quotes, um, those were not outliers. What surprised us is how the structural position of the landlord as a landlord at times seemed to matter more than um, than their race. Uh, that's a weird statement in a way, but um, it, it, it is fitting with some of the research on, if you look at the research on like welfare case workers and how they treat folks who are applying for public assistance, um, it, it appears that you don't see big differences by race of the welfare case worker. And, and I think we found something fairly similar here, which is that some of these stereotypes and attitudes really um, held across the race and gender of the landlord, um, with some exceptions, certainly. Yes. Can you just say more about how you're thinking about race and all of this? Mm -hmm. Because when I'm looking at DC, Dallas, Cleveland, Baltimore, those are very different regions that have very different racial histories yeah. that have very different kind of patterns of moving, you know, people moving from the south up north. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're so different. Mm -hmm. And even to sort of have this finding that that race matters less than just being a landlord, mm -hmm. help, help me because this whole story is about race on the front end, mm -hmm. all of it, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that they're only renting to people of color, that all of this voucher program is to people of color. The race story is so huge. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes really tiny in this portion of it. And so I'm not sure I get it. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how you can compare DC, Baltimore, Dallas, and Cleveland, mm -hmm. and have some way to make sense of them all in one yeah. way. Yeah, you know. Yeah, can you no, just say more about like absolutely. what race is in this magnificent story? Absolutely, and 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 they're certainly widely different urban context, yeah. as you point out, with very different histories. And Dallas in particular is an outlier because it has yeah. a really significant um, immigrant and Latino population that does not exist in the other three cities. Yeah. Um, one thing I can say is that because we are focusing on the affordable housing market, I think this surprised us too, that there were just incredible commonalities in the affordable housing market across these four cities, even though they appear so different. So if we were looking at the more um, upscale, less affordable housing market, I think we would see a lot more differences actually. Um, but when you're focusing on affordable housing, the landlord strategies themselves were remarkable remarkably consistent um, across cases. I'm looking for um, another slide that I don't think I have here. Um, but I, I mean, I think there's a lot to your question of how I'm thinking about race. Um, there's a lot of ways to answer that, but I think the, the way in which it comes into place, it comes into play in this study is um, as a reason, as a reason to be wary of renting to someone in in the land, like it in in landlords' conception of race, which is what we're trying to channel here, all it really means to them is is this tenant risky or not, um, and their ideas about race and their stereotypes about race and the way they conflate race with other kinds of, you know, character traits. Um, shape how they think about who is going to be a good tenant to rent to. But as we say at the beginning, in the affordable housing market, and not just in the affordable housing market, in really any housing market in this country, if you go into any given neighborhood, it's not like you have a full array of everyone in the city coming through to see every single apartment, right? It's going to be really um, selected before you even have the open house as to who's actually going to show up to visit that apartment. So we're not, we're not, when I say we're talking about race, we're, we're trying to understand the landlord's conception of race, um, which, which is, I think, a fairly narrow conception. Um, does that help? I'm going to keep thinking. Okay. I, I want to hear more. We, okay. we can talk afterwards. Uh, I saw some more hands. Yes. Um, slightly similar to the question of your different contexts. So I wonder if you can compare across your case cities, what was the landlord's experience of interacting with authorities? Did they get pulled up for these practices? Did somebody look, you know, yeah. see through that? 
Uh, were they wary of certain techniques because they were likely to be pulled up? Yes. What was their relationship with with authorities that would pull them up under the Fair Housing Act? Yeah, for sure. So we had one of the hardest times we had getting folks to talk to us was in Dallas. And it was because they kept thinking we were fair housing auditors who were showing up on their doorstep to trick them into doing something illegal. Um, and so whether it was the property managers or the, or the landlords, they were very, very wary of talking to us. And when they did talk talk to us, they would just give these like rote formulaic explanations of what they did. And we're like, no, but what do you really do, right? And it was very hard to push beyond that. But it turned out that that was, I think, a finding in itself, I think, for whatever reason dallas is a context in which you have a lot more fair housing auditors i think in part it's because it's a very corporate landlord environment and you tend to see those fair housing audits targeted um, towards larger landlords kind of get more bang for your buck if you audit someone who is managing thousands of properties than if they're just managing 10. Um, also there's a history of the walker case in dallas which was um, one of the fair housing lawsuits um, that, that we saw across the country but one of one of the really landmark ones that um, alleged that the um, that the public housing authority had segregated public housing by race um, and there was a consent decree that came out of that um, interest really interesting work by the inclusive communities project who now runs their mobility voucher program um, but given this context I think there has been um, a lot more focus on on sort of the legal side of fair housing in Dallas than in other places um, so that's that's the biggest difference that stands out to me um, that being said the the landlords relationships with the housing authorities really really vary so for example again in Dallas landlords were happy to work with the Dallas Housing Authority and they were happy to accept voucher holders from the Dallas Housing Authority but the Dallas County Housing Authority which is just next door many of them would just shook their head and say oh no I don't take voucher tenants from Dallas County because not of the tenants but because of the Housing Authority so their relationship to authority when it comes to the Housing Authority is is really really important um, in shaping their willingness to participate in the program so that's like a layer even before they get into these different Yes, things. absolutely. Thank um, you. Yeah, in the back. Did you have any insight into what the perspective of the landlords were before and after the introduction of, say, an algorithmic technique for selection, where they said, well, before we were getting this type, hmm. and after we were getting this other type? Because there's claims about the role of algorithms, and it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I did not. Uh, I do not recall anyone stating explicitly that something changed in that regard, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were worried about talking about that explicitly. That, that's something for us to go back and look for, actually. Yeah. So I'm curious about, you found a lot of like commonality like within the different affordable housing markets you studied and also like between the different cities. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, if you looked into like how this diffusion occurs? Like, is it just that these individuals all kind of like, these individual landlords all like, the contacts are like all pressuring them, hmm. and getting them to make these kinds of decisions mm -hmm. in this way? Or like, are landlords sharing strategies with one another? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know there's like all these landlord like website forums where yes. people share ideas and there's like landlord association. Yeah, there's. There's very strong sort of landlord culture. We went to a lot of these um, investor meetings um, and they disseminate strategies and tactics and ideas and programs very strongly amongst themselves. So in part, it is this whole landlording investor culture that is really has a very strong pull. In part, I also think it's their sort of structural market position. I think they, they come to very obvious um, if, if they're at all professionalized, they come to some very obvious, clear strategies that are the best strategies for that market position. Um, and they come to it, whether they're in Dallas or Cleveland, um, in similar ways. Yes? All right, we're, we have time for one last question. Okay. Well, you mentioned the power of financial incentives, and this kind of like made me think of the idea of like predatory inclusion. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if like any connection there, like imagine maybe this is like, not an issue of fairness, but like an extractive practice hmm. that targets like racialized people. 
Well, I, I do think about it that way, but in a slightly different way than you're suggesting. So when I think about the landlords in these poor neighborhoods um, who are targeting voucher holders and recruiting them, which is something we talked about a little, little more earlier today than I did in this talk, but in the neighborhoods where it's quite profitable for landlords to recruit voucher holders, I see that as a, as a form of predatory inclusion in the sense that those voucher holders are then not able to, to um, sort of get the full array of options. Um, do I think that offering landlords incentives to participate is a sort of predatory inclusion? I think less so, I, because I think that the more landlords we recruit, the, the more options folks have um, for where to live. All right, please join me in thanking. Uh,